Hey, thank you, Tuan. Uh, thank you for saving me for having to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, happy, happy to speak in this session. It's actually been an amazing session. And I think I'm going to try to, uh, I didn't plan this early on, but I'm going to try to connect with all the other speakers as I can. <laughs> so uh, the, the topic I want to talk about really is hardcore quantum computing. But um, I think the connection to photonics will be rather obvious in the building of these devices. And I'll make an argument for that but also some of the tools and techniques we find in, uh, in many body optics, for lack of a better term, um, is, is manifest as well in the control uh, of, of these systems. So you've all heard maybe, uh, maybe ad nauseum, the, uh, the promise of quantum computing. Um, I, I would say that um, there is a lot of hype in the field. I, I'm not sure that quantum computing will be a panacea for all of future computing, however, there are problems out there that are so hard for that, that are that will always be impossible for classical computing, basically because the configuration space of these problems is much too big, even compared to the size of the universe, the number of degrees of freedom we could ever control. Um, and this is because of the, the exponential scaling uh, you get when you entangle quantum systems. So Quantum computing starts with qubits, which are an extension of bits that can be in superpositions of zero and one. Uh, and of course, when you put lots of qubits together, there's something called entanglement that, that gives this space. And let me give you an idea how that works. And I, this is, this is uh, quantum computing in, in under two minutes here. Um, fortunately, it's, it's possible, really. Uh, just don't think about it too hard. Uh, so a quantum computer uh, to me is, has, has a good news, bad news, good news narrative. And the good news is I already hinted at this. When you put qubits together, the state space of the numbers you can represent grows exponentially. So one qubit can hold two values, zero and one at the same time with arbitrary weightings or, or amplitudes. Uh, this is a picture, a cartoon of three qubits. Of course, there are eight three-bit numbers, and you can, in principle, store any superposition of those. This is an entangled state. Um, and the idea, roughly, in a quantum computer is that somehow it can experience all of these eight states. And even when you compute a function once, it's computing on all eight inputs simultaneously. And in a sense, you get all eight answers. So eight is not so big, but with not too many qubits, a few hundred qubits, it indeed gets really big. And this is sort of what I said before, with just 300 qubits, 300 electrons or 300 photons, in principle, if you have enough control, you can control, you, you can experience more configurations in that system than there are atoms in the entire universe. So this is, this is not hype, this is truth. Of course, the, the, the hype comes uh, sometimes because we ignore the bad news. And the bad news is, um, as, as you know, a quantum superposition only exists when you're not looking when you're not measuring so the system a good quantum system has to be nearly extremely uh, you know nearly perfectly isolated from its environment so the bad news of course if you have all these superpositions of outputs when you look at it when you measure the output of your computer and every computer needs to be measured uh, you only get one answer and that answer is completely random in general so uh, there's no gain uh, if you're computing a one-to-one -one function it would appear but it turns out there is a final piece of good news, and this really only hit the press in the 1980s or early 1990s, and that is before you make a measurement in a entangled quantum system, you can, you can push around the quantum state and its entanglement, so there are lots of interferences. And at the end of the day, it's possible that um, almost all of the answers interfere destructively, meaning that you, uh, you have lots of zeros here, and maybe you only have one answer or a few answers. You don't have two to the 300 answers, though. You can't really deal with that. But if there are a few answers or maybe 300 answers, you can get an idea of the distribution. And so if, a, if an application can be cast in this form where we can make these interferences happen, by the way, these orange dots, this is, this is very hard to draw, but uh, these orange dots are quantum logic gates. They promote the interference and examples of that we've heard in many of the talks in this session, you know, photons interfering on a beam splitter. That's in a sense a quantum gate between those two, uh, between those two modes holding photons, for instance. Um, but the idea of, of uh, translating a real algorithm for doing something useful into a, into a set of gates 
uh, uh, multi-qubit gates. This is really the art of the quantum information processor and the, and, and the whole field of quantum computer science uh, is involved with trying to find if there are you know, a bigger cast of problems that can, be, that can be put in this form. There aren't that many. A very famous one is the factoring algorithm of Peter Shore in the mid 90s. And that's a wonderful example where we can prove everything. We know that there's only a polynomial number of gates required to factor a number, polynomial in the number of bits to represent that number. Classically, we know factoring, at least we don't know of any factoring algorithm that is polynomial in the number of bits. It's exponential, the, the best known algorithm. So that's an exponential speed up for a particular problem that's very hard because to factor an interesting number means that that number has thousands of digits, meaning with error correction, I'm not talking about this uh, very much, millions or billions of qubits and probably trillions of gates. So, you know, no technology is there yet. But uh, factoring algorithm is interesting because we can prove, we, we know the complexity of that algorithm. Now, there's another set of algorithms that you can't prove much about them, but they're much more widespread. And this last figure I've drawn here gives you a hint. Um, th these problems deal with lots of inputs and they only have one answer. So uh, the, catch the catch word I use to describe this class of algorithms is optimizers, optimization. Uh, typically, a very hard optimization problem has lots of inputs, lots of configurations, but only one uh, optimal answer. Now, nobody believes a quantum computer can actually do that kind of a problem exactly to find, say, the minimum value of a nonlinear function that has a million variables. Um, a classical computer can't do it either, for sure, because that's a combinatorial, combinatorial op optimization problem. It, it obviously scales exponentially. But a quantum computer, um, while it probably can't solve for the ground state or the highest, you know, the, the maximum value uh, of, of that function, it may be a heuristic that does better than, than uh, high performance computers out there. It's really unknown. You can't prove things about it. So it's a little frustrating uh, if you're a theorist. Uh, to, to talk about optimization problems. But, you know, I'm, fortunately, I'm not a theorist. I build quantum computers and we want to build them and test them for, uh, for algorithms such as this. And as we build our quantum computers bigger and bigger, we want to tailor them and co-design them to particular problems that are out there. So to me, that's a very exciting enterprise. Uh, and it involves lots of uh, different technologies to build these things. And of course, skills from computer science Many of those I don't have personally, but it, it, it's an excuse for me to work with people way outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> um, so I mentioned quantum computer hardware is pretty exotic. It needs to be extremely well isolated from the world. And I uh, group these into two families. Uh, on the right hand, we have, uh, uh, I would call them synthetic qubits. These are quantum systems that are typically in the solid state. Uh, they're sort of the quantum version of transistors made out of silicon or something like that. A very uh, important one is uh, superconducting circuits. The isolation there comes from the ability of current to flow without resistance. And you can print uh, superconducting loops on a chip, have them interact in a certain way and build a system that way. Um, I would say I'm not, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of research that needs to be done and there are some breakthroughs that really have to happen for synthetic qubits to be able to, uh, to grow even beyond a dozen or a few dozen qubits. You can't just throw a million qubits on a chip and call it a quantum computer. You need coherence. You need to be able to do many operations on those qubits. If you have a million qubits, you may need, uh, you may need 10 to the 12 operations on those qubits. So you better have a very clean system. So on the left-hand side, I think these are systems that right now uh, have promised to be built into, uh, into devices that can do useful problems. These are the so-called natural qubit systems uh, like atoms, electrons, photons, atomic ions. These are all systems, th these are all quantum systems that we don't build, we don't manufacture them. So they're perfect, they're given to us. You know, we don't make an atom and we're not going to approve a single atom. The, the, the difficulty in the natural qubit platforms is their control. How do you isolate them from the environment? It's not about manufacturing yield. The yield can be perfect and the performance of idle qubits based on atoms can be perfect because they're atomic clocks after all. So I'm gonna talk about one particular platform. 
Uh, these are atoms that are charged atomic ions. And uh, again, they're, they're one of the, th this table, by the way, came from a science review many years ago written by the editors. And I've added a few, uh, a few updates since then. In particular, the industrial uh, investments in these technologies is pretty stunning. Uh, and so somehow the, the behemoths are still interested in synthetic qubits. That's great. They're going to be doing research for decades to come. I think the real systems that are going to be proven in the next you know, five to 10 years are based on systems that the big companies so far are kind of staying away from. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's the platform I'm going to talk about. This is a, uh, those blue dots are individual atoms, atomic ions, and they are trapped. They are electrically confined above this chip trap. This chip is made at Sandia National Laboratories. They have a, a very active ion trap group there. Sandia in the US, as you know, is the sort of the government silicon foundry. <laughs> so they, they can do, they can afford to do in, you know, re re speculative research like this. And there's nothing really exotic about the silicon chip. It's multi-level. It holds off lots of voltage, a few hundred volts of RF uh, over a few microns of silicon dioxide. It's painted with gold, but there's nothing quantum about the chip at all whatsoever. It has about 100 electrodes. You can't really see the details. These atoms are floating above the surface. I hope you can see my uh, cursor. Floating about a tenth of a millimeter above the surface. And left to right here is about a half a millimeter. So each atom is, each ion is um, uh, separated by its neighbor by a few microns. And they're obviously optically resolved. We're shining laser light on these atoms to generate that image. Of course, when we run a quantum computation on these atoms, qubits inside the atoms, um, e each atom is a single qubit. We turn that light off because we, we can't measure the system, of course, while we're doing coherent operations. This chip is in a vacuum chamber. I forgot to mention that important point. So there's no air to collide with these atoms. These atoms are really the perfect quantum uh, 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 device because these atoms, all they have are their neighbors. They're not part of a surface or a solid, they're all absolutely identical. These are ytterbium ions, if you, if you care, if you're an expert, there are a handful of atomic ions that have very strong scattering properties. And, and to connect with some, you know, some, uh, a few of the uh, topics Dan talked about, I pulled this out from a few years ago. Um, it's not surprising we can get diffraction limited performance on imaging these atoms because they're very cold. The atoms are actually laser cooled to be a few nanometers in position, uh, their, their width, um, and they're, they're in a 10 megahertz bowl. So they, they, uh, they, have a, they sort of have a wave packet. Because we know where they are, they have to move. So, so the, that, that means they're not point sources, they're a few nanometers. Um, and the light is in the near UV, 370 nanometers, and we can get very nice diffraction limited performance in imaging these. This is, this is a trap holding exactly two ions separated by a little over five microns. Um, and uh, you know, fo following the, the, the uh, uh, display of the, you know, the wonderful uh, fluorescence experiments that Dan talked about, this was a little bit of a side note. Um, we had a very stable ion trap. The ions pretty much are nailed to the chip. And if everything is very stable, we can, we can uh, integrate the signal. And as, as Dan said, it's a question of signal to noise to get the resolution way below a wavelength just because we have a very bright emitter. You know, each atom emits about 100 million photons per second. We capture about a percent of those. Um, and that's still a fine signal to noise. And we start to hit drift limits in this L invariance plot of the, uh, the uh, uncertainty of the position of the centroid of the atom over integration time after a few tenths of a second. Uh, and we, we show results that are about a half a nanometer per root hertz uh, with a limiting resolution of about two nanometers here. Um, Again, in ion trap work, it's maybe not so impressive. And this is also pretty exotic. You don't find ytterbium ions in the vacuum in your body. So it's not gonna be useful to, to, do, to do biology, I suppose. But just to shows, this just shows you how much control we have over the system. Um, now the downside, and this is probably why Google and IBM didn't wanna uh, make ion trap quantum computers because this is sort of what they look like <laughs> when you step back. And of course, this is because it's an optical system we, we, have, uh, we have laser beams that are tunable and so forth. Every optic is on a three, on a three knob mount and so forth. Um, so this is a picture of one of my labs from several years ago. And in a collaboration with Jung Sang Kim here at Duke, 
um, we've pretty much packaged that whole thing uh, into this box here. It's about a meter cubed. Um, and uh, this was uh, funded by IARPA and the NSF to build a system that the user of a quantum algorithm, the, the user uh, of the quantum computer wants to run algorithms without knowing anything about atoms or atomic physics. And that's really what we wanted to do here. So inside that box, what is it? Well, it's a bunch of atoms and I didn't get into the atomic physics, but we poke we poke each atom with an individual laser beam and we can modulate those laser beams, amplitude, phase, and, and frequency uh, in order to execute gates, quantum gates. And how do these gates work? Very briefly, we, I, I think of a string of atoms sort of like a guitar string and we're basically plucking the guitar string. Um, we can pluck any number of these atoms, but we typically do two qubit gates and single qubit gates, they're sufficient. We can do more than that, but when you pluck a guitar string in two places, they all they, they, there's an interaction between their qubits. And again, I'm not going through the quantum mechanics, it's very well understood. It allows us to make entangled states and to express algorithms, okay? So it comes down to a controller that will uh, control this fairly exotic multi-channel acoustic optic modulator. Um, and when we first built this system, we were struck by the fact that we were, um, we were building a quantum stack. I mean, at the bottom, we have the hardware, individual atoms, and there's lots of quantum optics in the light matter interactions going on there. Then sooner enough, we get into laser pulse shaping and how to control these pulses to, to recognize particular quantum gates. If we want to express them in terms of textbook gates, there's a compiler step. And at the very high level, we have algorithms. Again, our, our goal of, of separating the user from the bottom level hardware was somewhat fulfilled in this. We were doing atomic physics in the morning and in the afternoon we were running algorithms on this system. Um, so uh, when we uh, first started doing these experiments, we, we had all kinds of collaborators that would come to our doorstop or our email and say, we have something we would love to run on your machine. Can we do it? And, and I think uh, Raphael is in here somewhere. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, uh, where we ran some simulations of the, of the, uh, of the bound uh, De deuteron nucleus. Um, and the last few years have been very busy. Again, like I said earlier, being a student, learning things that we didn't know before. And I should acknowledge Norbert, Marco, and Crystal, who are all on the uh, faculty in physics and ECE here at Duke, uh, for, uh, for uh, stimulating some of these collaborations and, and making them go through. It's been really fun. And it's, it, uh, for me, this field has left atomic physics and almost left physics in a certain way. Of course, there's a lot of physics we're doing at a very high level, but we're also doing chemistry and, and you know, hard biological problems in some cases. So it's a very exciting field. Now, um, what are we gonna do in the future? How are we gonna scale beyond 32 qubits I showed in that last slide? Well, we're not limited there at all. And optics is gonna to come to the rescue here in an interference type uh, interface that was described by uh, both Raphael and Dan. Uh, we know how to entangle atoms that are actually off chip on a different chip in a modular way by interfering them on a beam splitter and recognizing a hong u mandel interference. Basically, in a nutshell, um, each atom emits a photon whose polarization or other degree of freedom is entangled with the host atom. And then when we destroy these photons by detecting certain coincidence events, the atoms are entangled. And it's sort of like hooking up a wire between the two quantum processor units, and then we can extend the, the size of our quantum computer that way. It's easy to do this in PowerPoint. Um, however, over the last 15 years, we've pretty much demonstrated all of the uh, one plus one protocols that you can think of doing, remote entanglement. And of course, in the future, we, we hope to scale in a very big way by linking these things with a multi-port optical switch. And uh, what, what's notable here is that um, these connections are fully connected. We can connect any qubit from any uh, QPU uh, based on the configuration of that switch. And I'm lucky to have as a colleague, Jung Sang Kim, who once upon a time built the world's largest multi-port optical switch at Bell Labs uh, a long time ago. So the recipe for scaling in trapped ions, actually, you know, this looks like a physics experiment, I guess it is, but uh, because, uh, because we know what we want, we can really shrink the profile of that experiment. We're, we're already running with systems. This is from Jung Tang's group at Duke, where we have maybe a foot cubed of stuff and there's still a lot of white space there. We are right now, starting last year, we've been uh, actually putting the vacuum chamber right on the chip 
So this is the entire vacuum chamber you see here. We look forward in the future for having integrated photonics to help us not only control these qubits, but also have them interfere, as I mentioned, for scaling. Again, these pictures are easy to draw, but there's no physics needed here. We don't need physics breakthroughs. And that's really different from any solid state platform. So uh, uh, Tuan mentioned, uh, there's a company that Junxang and I started uh, several years ago that's uh, growing really fast. And uh, it's, it's remarkable how fast that company has been building systems. They've built eight uh, systems and three more on the way. And they're now a public company, uh, which, which happened last fall. And again, we have, we have a few years to really show commercial value to what we're doing here, but we're, we're really leading the charge and the path in performance of any quantum computers. Now, what about Duke? What are we doing here at Duke? Most of my time I'm spending at Duke building the Duke Quantum Center, which um, aims to use quantum computers for science, not necessarily for commercial activity. And I think having scientific applications are, is, is what's going to keep quantum computing very stable over the next few years until we get a, a commercial application, which will even make it much more interesting in academics. And so we're rapidly building a big team here in the Chesterfield building in downtown Durham to build quantum computers in a user facility uh, mode that will co-design our systems to apps. So I think I'm oh, just about on time and that's all I have. So I'm happy to take a few questions if they're, if they're out there.